Eduardo Cohn, so nice to have you here, and thank you for being part of this conference. We've been dealing with a topic that we're groping towards, mm -hmm. and certainly we don't have any definition, and that's good. Mm -hmm. But the, the topic is a living earth, and mm -hmm. what does that mean for us? And what are your thoughts on that at this point? I think one of the challenges that we face today on our earth on our planet has to do with who we are uh, and how we're part of the planet and the earth. Um, it's sort of a truism that we're alive as humans <clears throat> and we kind of have some sense of what that might mean, although there are parts of that that we brush aside. Um, but I think the question for us as humans is how does that kind of life fit with grow out of, relate to, emerge from a larger kind of life? Um, and where does that extend? And this becomes an issue uh, today because uh, it's becoming abundantly clear that there's a disconnect between our kind of life and that other kind of life. Um, we see it with a, a planetary problem, climate change, that seems that, whose cause seems to be the disconnect. So I think it's a very, um, a very real problem to f figure out this thing at the level of concepts of how, just how are we connected to this larger living thing that is larger than us, is not fully us, but makes us, is not, we are not reducible to it, but we grow out of it. That's the kind of challenge I think we have, <clears throat> and many of us are the people that come together and came together today this weekend in this conference are sort of tasked with envisioning this and in, in, in dreaming it, imagining it, figuring out a way in which that connection um we can figure that out and then make it again meaningful um so I come from it. I think we could all, these are big, big stories, big ideas, and big ideas are actually become, can become actually quite little if they're not actually grounded in some kind of reality. Mm -hmm. um, and my own, my own work, uh, there are many kinds of ways of grounding that in reality. But in some sense, I think we all agree that there's some sort of need to connect those big things with some sort of experience, some sort of empirical. I come, I come from this as an anthropologist. Um, anthropologists, uh, I, I see as somebody who is charged with um, immersing oneself in a kind of reality, empirically so, even though, even that, even if that experience is not always about stuff, could be about ideas or dreams or other kinds of presences that we don't really understand, but immersing ourselves in a kind of space and domain where those things uh, can be allowed to resonate through us and, and their realities come through. Um, that we're charged as anthropologists to, to erase ourselves as we kind of allowed this other thing to bubble forth. Then, of course, we have to come back and reflect on our relationship to that thing that has bubbled forth. Um, but so this is a very important um, notion for me. And now, but concretely, it comes to me in my work in the Amazon. I'm an ethnographer and anthropologist of the Amazon, um, of indigenous people who live in the Amazon. And of course, when I attend to how they live in the Amazon, it's not just a question of um, them, um, me hanging out just with them because they hang out with others. And those others are, are not necessarily human. Uh, they are the beings that make up the forest, the world that, that is the forest. Um, so I've, you know, as my ethnographic challenge has been to figure out uh, how that relationship is possible. Um, the kind of ways in which we see living humanly uh, doesn't usually let us understand how we live with these other kinds of others that do things the way we do and don't do things the way we do. These other kinds of others communicate and think. Uh, not necessarily the way we do, but yet we can do it with them in some ways if we allow ourselves to. So a lot of my work has been figuring that out uh, at a kind of uh, 
conceptual level, but a conceptual level that is grounded in real empirical things. Actually, how people do this, actually being there doing it. Uh, that has that work has grown. That work has now uh, morphed into something a little bit uh, more urgent and practical, which is to say. If one can discover, as I feel like I have, not discover, reveal, it's, it's, it's known to other people, but communicate this fact that we are part of this thinking forest, which is a kind of a living entity that is larger than us, um, that this um, is not only something real, but it actually is something good. And if it's something good, then we need to find ways to allow its reality to continue and to allow uh, us to learn more about how that would happen by listening to it. Mm -hmm. So my sense of what I'm trying to, uh, my what draws me to the question of a living earth is the sense that the earth itself as a living earth can tell us uh, a little bit more about how to live on this earth. Mm -hmm. I love that you've just said there's something good here. Mm -hmm. um, just elaborate that a little bit more. <clears throat> well, I think that um, I, I, I think that th there's a there's a, a complicated question of 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 of, um, of meaning. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we tend to think of of science um, as uh, you know, Weber put it well. Um, there's a sense that. Um, we can we've learned very well with science and even the humanities uh, and the social sciences to sort of analyze something uh, and take it apart and understand it well. But why, why it's what it's how that relates to how to live well, how that relates to meaning in that sense is is, is unclear. Um, and I think that um, the and then we uh, we we kind of build up meaning. Uh, as humans, as humans in our own particular way of living, we build up the meaning uh, in our worlds. Mm -hmm. um, but the the proposition of the living earth is to say that doesn't work anymore. That that that's wrong and it doesn't work because um, our meaning systems are, are are destroying the living earth on, from which we also live. And the question now is to think how can meaning what are the ways in which meaning um, is is der derived can be learned from listening to the living earth, um, and that's that's a very difficult question. Um, one can say that it does come from that, but how does that help us uh, make specific decisions? So how does one how does one uh, derive a certain kind of ethical comportment um, from? A world that is meaningful, but not exactly in the way that we know. Uh, that's the. It's a big challenge, and I think that that's something that I think we still have to work out. Mm -hmm. But I know where to look for it. Mm -hmm. You know, not to be too academic, but Holmes Rostin, the environmental ethicist, mm -hmm. said these ecosystems are working towards creative disequilibrium you can mm -hmm. say uh and so on but they're always moving in relationship to yeah. these these uh parts of the system but he would say that value rests there because they're working towards the flourishing of mm -hmm. these entities within the systems right connected to of course death and decay and decomposition and so on but there's something he would suggest that's a value there and so that is one of his ways of saying value emerges uh, yeah. in the world. Well, yeah, I mean, I think what's there are some pieces of this that I feel are, are you know, do seem to make some sense to me. So, for example, um, why we have something like meaning or uh, good or bad, well, that emerges from a very basic sense of good and bad that, that emerges with life. Uh, mm -hmm. There is, there are environments that are good or bad for an organism in question. Exactly. Uh, that sense of value is, is our sense of value is in the relation of emergent continuity with that kind of value. Mm -hmm. But that only gets us so far. Mm -hmm. um, how do we actually orient and make decisions of, about 
the world um, and, and and about our place in it by in ways that think with that living earth, mm -hmm. uh, think with uh, a forest that thinks. And <clears throat> I've, I've, I'm struggling with that, but I think, uh, and some of this emerged in the conference, uh, I think it has to do with a, a specific relationship of beauty to ethics. Mm -hmm. um, and beauty, uh, not just pretty, uh, a complex kind of a beauty, but a beauty that has to do with the sense of a certain kind of appreciation for holistic emergence. Mm -hmm. That is, there is a sense of that which is beautiful is a place, is, is, is a dynamic in which many kinds of others are in, in a non-reductionistic way emergently uh, re, uh, come to be part of a larger whole. That is that is beauty, and that is um, seeing where that is happening and where it's disrupted, or seeing where the disruptions are necessary such that a larger one can happen. That is some that gets a little further in orienting us. So how do we do that? I mean, I so I a lot of that. Some of it comes through my thinking through some philosophers, but some of it comes through uh, my ethnography of working with Amazonians who are. Um, often uh, are, in a sense, always trying to, to align their ethical comportment with, um, with uh, this larger, um, some larger uh, kind of living spirit entity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the way they do that is, is often through dreaming, because dreaming allows for this sense of seeing through a very special mode of constrained confusion, allowing um, allowing a, a, a way to see how um, things that might otherwise seem disparate are actually part of a one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then once you see that connection, you can make that connection mm -hmm. in in the practical world of practice. Mm -hmm. So tapping into <clears throat> intuition, as you say, dreams yeah. to the subconscious world and so on. Yes, because for me, when 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 I think of a living earth, I think of a thinking earth. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure yet where, how big to make that earth. I mainly talk about a living and thinking forest, and I even don't not really sure where that frontier is. Mm -hmm. But there's some sort of larger entity that has some of the dynamics of mind, mm -hmm. um, and tapping into that partially requires tapping into the qualities that make that mind mind. Mm -hmm. I'm often, and maybe this is a probably, maybe it's the wrong term politically, but it's the right term conceptually. I think of anthropology as a psychedelic science. Um, it is mind manifesting as the Greek uh, etymology uh intimates because it, it can open uh, the ethnographic met method, which is simply the method of immersion into something that unmakes you, <coughs> can open the mind um, onto something else that allows for the manifestation of a larger mind. Uh, and that's something that we can do at a kind of social level and psychological level, but it's something we can also do at the planetary level. Um, the The challenge is to in our times of planetary climate change and and the and the and ecological simplification and devastation that that is bringing, um, is to is to learn how to see what does it mean? What does living mean? Living means mind manifesting emer the emergence of mind in the form of spirit. Yeah. It's living is psychedelic, and the question is how do we link our minds with that mind? And it requires sometimes thinking like a forest. The place we think most like a forest is in our dreams. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful <clears throat> and generative. And I look forward to considering the next steps here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.